When I was just a boy, I never forget an incident where I was caught doing something I shouldn't have been doing. And what I did was not so important as how my mother reacted to it as the memory stays with me to this day. And I think it's relevant to how God looks at us and sees us in our life and in our world. Caught in the act, my mother comes to me and I'm expecting a scolding. And my father was the dominant figure in our home and uh, if he had been there I would have got a blistering as he put it. He would have headed my feet toward the South Pole and my head toward the North Pole and warmed the equator as you probably have experienced or heard yourself in those days. And my mother comes to me and I'm standing there with my head down and I'm covered and filled with shame and I know that my loving mother is disappointed in me. I can see that look in her eyes, so my head's down. My mother comes and she gently puts her hand under my chin and she raises my face. And she looks me right in the eye and says, Son, I love you. Jesus loves you. Let's pray and ask him to forgive you for what you've done. And there I was at the age of six with my mother kneeling beside the chair in our kitchen and asking Jesus to forgive me. Now you may think that a six-year-old can't possibly be aware enough of what's going on in the world to repent of their sin. I knew what I had done was wrong. And listen, if a child is old enough to know the difference between a truth and a lie, then they're old enough to know that they need to be sorry. And that's significant and important. It's a fact that I think we've lost in our day and in our time. The most important thing, though, is the way my mother responded. Instead of looking at me when I was in despair, I was emotionally, morally in despair at the age of six. My mother took her hand, put it on my chin, and lifted my head. There's a beautiful passage of Scripture in Psalm chapter 3, verse 3, that says, You, O King, are... And it lists a couple of things, but the most important thing that's on my heart today is that you, O King, are the lifter of my head. I'm so thankful for those times in my life when I looked at life and the circumstances of life and thought, this is hopeless. There, there's just nowhere to go from here except down. That's just, you know... Uh, I know you were thinking up, but you get in that frame of mind where you think it's it's not bad enough, it's going to get worse. And we need to remember during those critical times of our lives that God is the lifter of our heads. In our desperate times, He reaches down and He takes us by the chin gently and lifts our face up and says, Child, look at me because I'm the lifter of your head. As a wonderful truth, and that's why we're here today, is discuss the point of what's in Deuteronomy chapter 29. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel and the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. Now, in the context of the passage of Scripture, Moses is meeting with the children of Israel just before they get to go in and take possession of the promised land. And he's saying that what has been a curse to one generation, a failure to one generation, is an opportunity to the next generation. So Moses is standing here. He's looking this generation in the eye and saying, We made this covenant once before with your fathers. And they didn't keep their part of the covenant, so now we're going to give the opportunity for you to, to make this covenant. So he includes that idea that besides the covenant was made at Horeb, we're going to make this covenant today. Moses goes over the failure of the previous generation. It's essentially, he says, the nation of Israel, wandering around here in the wilderness, has seen many wonders. They've seen many signs. They've seen the supernatural works of God on and off this whole time that they've been in this wilderness, but they didn't see them. So listen to how it's 
stated in the scripture, Moses called all Israel and said to them, You've seen all the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials which your eyes have seen, the signs and the great wonders. Yet the Lord did not give you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. So with all these signs and wonders that were a part of their life where they were in Egypt, they saw the plagues, they saw the death of the firstborn, they saw the Red Sea parted, they saw the Egyptian armies completely destroyed, they saw victories that came through prayer, they ate manna, they drank miraculously provided water, and they saw miracle after miracle. Yet this tragic statement is in the scripture, is yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive. And what we're caused to stop and think about is the fact that miracles in and of themselves could not accomplish what God had to accomplish in their hearts. The visual things that people see are no substitution for the miraculous work of God in the hearts of people. If God didn't his, send His Spirit to change their hearts, then all these wonders would not have made any difference at all. I think that some people believe that in our day and in our generation and the circumstances that we're in right now, it, God has missed a wonderful opportunity to do miracle signs and wonders to prove who He is. But let me tell you something. Our nation has seen all the signs and wonders it deserves. That's my opinion. We've seen all the signs and wonders we deserve, and we've not turned back toward God. What we need to have today is what Israel, at this point, up to this time, has failed to have, and that is an awakening in the heart. I know that when I was in high school, people thought that our generation was going to hell in a handbasket. That's really what they thought. I heard it over and over again. It was the drug culture. It was the free love society. Uh, it was the Vietnam era. It was the introduction of LSD and Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and all the wild music. And everybody just thought we were a lost cause. But God sent a guy named Billy Graham who went around this country, city after city, and by the droves, our generation came to faith in Jesus Christ. It was introduced, our generation was introduced to soul winning plans and we went out and we educated people and we sat down and built relationships with people and did our best to lead people to Jesus and our nation was turned. And now there's another generation that's come up. And as surely as God brought revival to our generation, my generation, God can bring revival to the generation that is now about to inherit this land. Listen, God said to them, I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes haven't worn out. Your sandals are not worn out. You've not eaten bread nor drunk wine or similar drink that you may know that I'm the Lord your God. And when you come to this place, King Heshbon and King Bashan shall come out and do battle with you. But we conquered them. We took their land and gave it to the Reubenites and the Gadites and a half tribe of Manasseh. Therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. God reminds them of what he's done. And he's literally promising that he'll do it again for the next generation. That should lift up your head. In this troubled time, in this time when it just seems like everything has come to a grinding halt in our spiritual terms, this month, it will have been a year ago that we suspended services in our church because of COVID. And for a period of time, we didn't have any services at all. And then we started back on a limited basis. And there's still, our whole congregation is not meeting together. There are some people associated with our church that haven't been inside of the sanctuary walls for a year this month. Others have been here at, from time to time, and now there's a renewed uh, scare on going across the world with modifications of the COVID. And we are at a place where we say, what in the world is going on? And how, how do we deal with the future? Well, listen, God's still in control. And that this wonderful passage of Scripture indicates that God reminds this next generation of what He did for the previous generation, and He, re, he gives them the opportunity to renew that covenant with them. And there's a spiritual application to this. The Word of God kind of 
indicates to us that we're in a wilderness in this world. We are in a spiritual wilderness. These are spiritually dark times. But God provides clothes for us. Revelation 3.18 says he will give us a robe of righteousness. Ephesians 6.15 says he'll prepare our feet with the shoes of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26 said he gives us the bread and wine which are a reflection of his death and his powerful resurrection. Romans 8, 37 says he, in him we will conquer our enemies. We are more than conquerors, the word of God says, through Christ who loved us and gave his life for us. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5 says we can take the land of our spiritual enemies. Greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. So we can look back on what God has done in the generation prior to us and in our generation and say, you know, God can do it again. There's no reason in the world God can't do exactly the same thing in the next generation. Here's what he says to the new generation. He says, therefore, keep the word of the covenant. See, looking back on these great works of God, it's just a logical response. We shouldn't be in despair and in gloom and doom. We know the greatness of God's love. We know the greatness of God's power. And instead of it making us withdraw from the battle, it should make us more committed than ever to the covenant that we have with God. Now, as they stood there in verses 10 through 15, and they were about to make this co covenant, God gathered the tr leaders and the tribes and the elders and everyone, including the little ones, also the stranger that was in their camp, those who cut woods, those who draw water, and that they may enter into the covenant. God's covenant, this is what we have to understand, was made for the entire nation. There is not an exclusive covenant that God has with just a small group of people. But God wanted that covenant to be with the leaders, the men, the women, the children, and even the servants. The, those who were indentured servants among their, their people. Today, the invitation goes still, whosoever will may come and take freely of the water of life. We need to remember that the government of the Hebrew people was God. God and his word, his covenant, his law was the government. It was the entire government. We live in a nation that has openly defied the idea or concept that we're a Christian nation. There are those in political positions of power who will tell you very quickly we are not a Christian nation. And as much as we hate to admit it, you know, they're right. Because our government, our people, by and large, have not submitted to the will of God or the covenant of God. But just because they have not doesn't mean they cannot. The gospel message is still the same. It still goes out to all who will. So he, he says in his word, in this passage of scripture, he is giving this opportunity that he may establish you today as a people for himself. God has called in every generation a people to himself, and I believe he's calling those in our generation, in this world today, in this new generation, to be a people for himself. He says, the covenant would extend beyond those who stood before him today, but that it would go for the generation. So, as well as with him who is not here with us today, him who is not with us here today. That included the descendants. Listen, I'm the spiritual leader of my home. I've been born again. I've been grafted in to the vine. I'm the head of my household. You say, boy, that doesn't fit well in our society. I'm talking about in the spirit realm. And I have taken the stand and will continue to take the stand. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, just so you understand, I want to serve the Lord. I want my house to serve the Lord, not under law, but under grace. I want my house to be free and liberated and powerful with the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life so that they're not overcome by the things of this world and the power of this world. Our generation has known what it's like to receive the fullness of Christ, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But do you think that our generation is the only generation to ever experience the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit? Heaven's sakes, no. There have been those in every generation who've experienced the presence and the anointing. And that's our prayer for this next generation, is that there would be a new anointing. There would be a fresh outpouring of the presence and the power of God so that there's something that beats deep in the hearts of men that says, I belong to God and He belongs to me. And that's a powerful place. It's not a place of anemic, weak Christianity, but it's a strong, powerful position. I am in Christ and He is in me. 
what a powerful position that is to understand that in humility I am nothing. I am, I am a person who was lost. The Word of God says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But those who have come to Him, if I invite Him into my heart and life, He will. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If you'll open, I'll come in and sup with you and you with me. I like the picture of Jesus coming in and sitting down and staying with us for a little while. That's exactly what this new generation needs. There is nothing in this world that substitutes for the presence and the power of, of that closeness that the Holy Spirit gives to us. This new generation can make this promise a part of the reality of their life. In verses 16 through 20 in this passage of Scripture, there's a a, a frightening and horrible picture is a picture of coming judgment to those who are covenant breakers. I think about the day and time in which we live and all the people who call themselves followers of Jesus Christ who are embracing behaviors, lifestyles that are completely contradicted by the Word of God. And I know there are those who think there are passages of Scripture that just aren't applicable to us today. But friends, if you say you are a follower of Jesus and that you love God and you love the Lord, then how can you not love His Word? How can you not embrace His Word? There are those who criticize the Bible, the Old Testament, and the New Testament, and say there's passages that are archaic and outdated. Even those in the New Testament, some people say, we're only for that generation and that day and that time. Listen, the Word of God was given to us, and all Scripture has been inspired by the Holy Spirit so that we have it for our lives. So take heed. Here's what the judgment was to covenant breakers for the covenant Moses was presenting them with that day. Now listen, we're under a new covenant because of the blood of Jesus. But when we get baptized, when we're born again, we enter into that covenant. And there are principles involved in this Old Testament covenant that are just as real today. The principle is, are you faithful to the words that you promised in the covenant that you made? Listen to what verses 16 through 20 say. For you know that we dwelt in the land of Egypt, that we came through the nations which you passed by. You saw their abominations, their idols which were among them, wood and stone and silver and gold, so that there may not be among you a man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations, and that there may not be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood, and so that it may not happen when you hear the words of this curse that he blesses himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace even though I have followed the dictates of my own heart as though the drunkard could be included with the sober. The Lord could not spare him for then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy would burn against that man and every curse that is written in this book would settle on him and the Lord would blot out his name from under heaven. Israel had seen the abominations, you see, of the idols in their pagan neighbors. God had promised that anyone who turned his heart away from the Lord to go and serve other gods would never presume on a sense of peace in his heart. Even if he said, I have peace. You know, perhaps the one who had turned from the Lord and to his idols hears the curses against the covenant breaker and thinks that he's going to escape any kind of penalty. So he blesses himself in his heart and he says, Oh, I have peace. And he may have a sense of immediate peace at that moment. But it is a peace, listen, it is a peace that is blind. It is the peace of the world which is ignorant. Who? It's a peace that cannot see the peril of his coming judgment. You see, a sinner may feel confident in his own heart, and there are many in our world today who claim they're followers of Jesus, and they're confident in their own heart. They have peace, but that peace is an illusion, my friend. It's the peace of the spiritually blind. It's this peace of the spiritually unknowing. Think about this. If there's a bomb on a plane, everyone on the plane may be at peace at that moment, right up to the moment the bomb explodes, but their peace is based on their ignorance. If they were aware there was a bomb on the plane, they would all be in a panic. In the same way, a sinner may not be troubled in their heart, but it's only because they're blind. The scripture says as though a drunkard should be included with the sober. The drunkard may be happy when he's drunk, 
because he's in a chemically induced state of mind. That seems to me to describe many in our nation today. You just watch the way they act and behave. It seems like they're in a chemically induced state of mind. Happiness based on an illusion. And God warns against including the peace of the righteous with the peace of the wicked. Or the, what the wicked may seem to have. What this scripture says is the Lord would not spare him. The truth is, according to Isaiah 48, 22, there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. And I have to tell you again, as much as the gospel message is in my heart, it's a gospel of God bringing liberty and peace. It's a gospel of grace. The word of God teaches us there's no peace for the wicked. And the score will be settled, if not in this world. It will be settled in eternity. But what you have to understand is, apart from the blood of Jesus Christ, apart from the grace of Christ, there, was, uh, there is an account that will be settled Listen, no one can forsake the Lord and escape the consequences. Now, I know there are those who are saying, Oh my goodness, you've done gone and got off track. No, I'm, I'm on track with what the Word says. This is the Word of God. This is not my opinion. The Lord would separate him from the tribes of Israel for adversity, according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in the book of law, so that, the coming generation of your children who rise up after you and the foreigner who comes from a far land would say when they see the plagues of that land and the sickness which the Lord has laid on it, the whole land is brimstone, salt and burning. It's not sown, nor does it bear, nor does any grass grow there like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboam, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and his wrath. All nations would say, why has the Lord done this to the land? What does the heat of this great anger mean? And the people would then say, Because they forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. For they went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods that they did not know and that he did not give them. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against this land to bring on it every curse that is written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from the land in anger, in wrath, and great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. There is a place of spiritual darkness that people will end up. That's what happened to Israel. They refused to go with God. They refused to keep their promise and their covenant with God. And they ended up in trouble. They ended up desolate. They ended up alone. They ended up forsaken. But there's this promise for those who return. The adversity is not given to destroy. The adversity is given to draw people to repentance. See, so that the coming generation of your people, the coming of the generation of your children who rise up, and the foreigner that comes from afar, God's purpose in bringing judgment against covenant-breaking Israel was for the sake of the coming generation of their people and the foreigner. So that when they saw the devastation that came from breaking God's covenant, when they saw what happened to the land which the Lord had overthrown, they would want to be warned or they would take the warning to be obedient. Our prayer has to be for this generation that they will learn from the calamity that's come on our nation, that's come on the lives of this generation around the world would understand that when we break God's covenant and turn away from God, we take ourselves out from under God's goodness and God's protection upon our lives. Oh, that all the nations would say, oh, that all the nations would say, we've seen what happens to those who forsake the Lord God. Listen, this chapter goes on to talk about the secret things that belong to the Lord. And today, as this is unfolding and these events are unfolding. There are people with a spiritual sense to understand that God is at work in all these problems that our nation is experiencing. I see it. Many others see it. But only those who have spiritual eyes can see that God's hand is at work. It amazes me that as much as many of the things that we see happening in our great nation are diametrically opposed to what the Word of God says. There were those on both sides of the fence that are claiming it's God's doing. Do you know that we often see what we want to see through the eyes of the flesh? And what's significant and important is we see our world and interpret and understand our world through the eyes of the Spirit, through the spiritual things that God reveals. 
You know what God says in Isaiah 55, 8 through 9? My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways. My ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God reveals some things to men, but you have to remember this. God doesn't reveal everything to men. It's just not possible for us to know. And we also need to understand this, that God's revelation usually says something to us. It's God speaking, not just to blow our mind or amuse us, but there's a message that belongs to us. We may not perfectly understand it, but it is understandable. You also need to understand this, that God's revelation is generation to generation. As surely as God gave this revelation to the children who were standing there under Moses saying there's an opportunity for you as a group of people to embrace God, renew this covenant, and have the blessings of God. So that same promise goes generation to generation. To this generation, I declare to you that the word of God now proclaims to you that if you will embrace the Lord and enter into a covenant with him, it's the new covenant, the covenant associated with the blood of Jesus Christ, that all the blessings that belong to the Lord are yes and amen to the people who follow in the name of Jesus. And there's this last thing. For our children and our children forever, God's revelation is eternal. His words not only last forever, but it is always relevant. That means forever and ever the Word of God is relevant. There's no such thing as the Word of God not being relevant. God's Word is more relevant than any new fad or new, new interest that sweeps over the world of the church. And the church is going through all these cycles of fads that they do, but the Word of God remains the same to every generation. And here's the reason for it. God's revelation is given, and it should matter to us. God's revelation is given, and it should matter to us. It should matter to us above all the politics that's going on in the world, all of the scientific evidence and things that, that are being thrown or hurled at the church today. The Word of God should matter to us more than what our friends' opinions are. It should matter to us more than what the most popular opinion or Hollywood or any person that we hold in high esteem and regard. The final analysis is that God's word should matter more than all of that. God has spoken to us, and it's not just to satisfy our curiosity about spiritual things. He's spoken to us to change the way that we live. If we only are hearers of the word and not doers of the word, then we've not really received the word. And how sad is the fate of those who receive the truth of the word of God. I think the most tragic statement in this segment of scripture is the idea that Israel saw but they did not see. Oh friend, join me as I pray that the people in America would open their eyes to the spiritual truths and the spiritual things around us and they would truly see. May God bless you as you ponder these words.